Hi everybody, this is Davis from Hardin County Conservation. Today we are going to continue our spring series, but we are going to mix it up a little bit from wildflowers and birds, and we're going to dive into the aquatic wildlife a little bit. So we're going to discuss water quality uh, in pretty serious extent, and then we are actually going to do some dip netting for aquatic insects and talk about how they correlate to water quality here in the state of Iowa. So looking behind me here, uh, most people would think you know, our, our wetland here at Calkins Nature Area is, is fairly polluted. You see a lot of algae mats that are, that are up near the surface. Uh, but in fact, this is pretty common in the majority of Iowa's wetlands. Uh, this does not tell me that this is a, a low quality ecosystem by any means. As a matter of fact, you will learn today that it is uh, middle to high quality and our bugs can actually tell us that rather than us having to use uh, chemical tests to be able to determine the, the health of our ecosystem. So. I'll dive into, into bugs a little bit here. So in Iowa, we have we categorize our aquatic insects into three main components. There's a low quality group, a middle quality group, and a high quality group. And in those three groups, we have a pretty significant diversity of aquatic macro invertebrates. Is, that's the term I'm gonna use rather than insects because some of these organisms are not insects. In the low quality group, we anticipate things like leeches, uh, midge larvae, or mosquito larvae being present in a given water body. So if we were to go and sample, say, a pond or a wetland that were low, that was low water quality, we would find those types of bugs. Uh, typically, those are high pollution areas as well. So they will have lots of nitrates. Uh, some might even have nitrites, which will kill off fish. Some will have high phosphate levels, low dissolved oxygen. Those are all pretty common characteristics of a low quality system. If we are looking at a middle quality system, we are going to see a significant change in the aquatic life that is there. Rather than seeing things like leeches in our low quality group, we are going to start to see things like scuds or dragonfly larvae or damselfly larvae or water striders or water boatmen. So we have a, a much better diversity in the middle quality group. And that is typically what we see in uh, Iowa in, in general ecosystems like the one that you see behind me here. So it's relatively impaired. It might have high nitrates and maybe low dissolved oxygen levels, but there are no issues with maybe things like nitrites or phosphates. So that totally depends on the system, but nonetheless, we do expect to see uh, those bug species that I just mentioned in that particular uh, water quality group. So they fall in that middle quality group. Uh, and that is generally what we see here. So we'll get to see some of those bugs here in just a minute. And then we also have high quality uh, individuals or high quality ecosystems that we can find in Iowa. Normally those are gonna be in systems that are moving. So rivers, streams, uh, creeks, and you're gonna find a, a way greater diversity of unusual insects in those places or aquatic macroinvertebrates in general. So we see things like Dobson fly larvae, stone fly larvae, mayfly larvae all live in those moving systems. So obviously behind me here we have a relatively stagnant wetland or pond so i'm not going to anticipate to find some of those higher quality individuals though i have found them here before we are going to instead see many of those middle quality groups so let's talk a little bit about the tools i'm going to use i'm going to slide over just a little bit here because i have better access to the bank well what i have in my hand is one of many tools that we use when we're when we're doing aquatic sampling in general this is what we call a d-net or a dip net and this is going to be kind of our best tool in a, a really shallow wetland ecosystem like we see here. So this pond or this wetland is maybe only two or three feet deep. If it were deeper, I would utilize other tools such as maybe a seine net, or if I were in a river, I might use a kick net, or uh, if I'm looking for fish rather than, let's say, aquatic macroinvertebrates, I might use a cast net. So there's all sorts of different tools we can use, uh, but this is going to be the best for me. So this is a D net. It gets its name because the, the hoop shape is actually in a D. We have this flat side here that actually lays flat on the substrate and helps me to scrape the substrate where a lot of those organisms live. And then the mesh on this is not super fine, but it is fine enough that a lot of those small aquatic organisms cannot fit through the mesh and through the netting. And the handle, pretty simple, looks just like a butterfly net. So just a little sturdier than what you'd use uh, for butterflies and, and terrestrial insects. So. In the pond behind me here, how I'm going to use this net, I'm not going to swing it like I would with a butterfly net, and I'm not going to scoop like a shovel. Those are not going to be the best ways to do this. Instead, since I have extra long arms, I can reach a long way out into this pond. I'm going to take my net and I'm going to flip it down into the substrate here. I'm going to drag that 
flat section of that net back and I'm going to scoop up a lot of that substrate because a lot of the organisms that I have that live in this pond, such as baby dragonflies or baby damselflies, actually live in what we call the uh, organic or detritus layer, which is all that organic material that's sitting on the bottom of the wetland. And the reason they are down there, one, to camouflage themselves to avoid predation, but two, if I'm a dragonfly, I'm down there to find my food. So. You'll notice here, I'm just kind of sifting the mud out. And once I have all my mud out, which it looks like I pretty well do, it's just a lot of organic material now. What we're gonna do, we're gonna walk it over to our table, which is over here positioned next to our ranger in the sun, so we can see some of this stuff. I'm gonna take my net, and if you have kids at home, this is where the activity gets really fun because they get to be dirty and they get to dig through mud and all sorts of good stuff. So awesome. Popped out right at the beginning here. In my hand, I have a baby dragonfly or a dragonfly nymph. So we're going to toss him in the bucket. That's great. Sift through some more of this stuff. I'm maybe only going to pick one or two more bugs because I want to talk to you guys about some of these critters individually here in just a second. Ah, here we go. Here's another dragonfly nymph. He's going to go in the water. And let's maybe call it good there. Let's just get our couple dragonflies. Okay, so after, let's say you were to take your kids out to do this at your pond or your stream behind your house or something. The last and probably the most important step is I want to make sure I don't have any bugs that I take out of this pond that are dead inside my net when I'm done. So I'm going to take this kind of substrate layer in my hand. I'm going to flip it, flop it in the water there. And I'm gonna make sure this net is extra clean and I want it to be extra clean on both sides because a lot of those clinging insects, particularly things like damselflies, will hold onto that net regardless of if you clean it or not. So we need to clean it extra well. And I might even flip it over and clean a couple sides of it. But you will notice it's super clean now. And what we are gonna do next is we are going to dive into our bucket here. I have lots of live critters. And I'm just gonna tilt it here, and you are gonna to get to see some of these awesome aquatic macroinvertebrates that we have. So check them out here. Okay, so we have some live aquatic macroinvertebrates we're gonna talk about here for you. These were ones that Claire and I collected in our pond behind Calkins Nature Area. These are all going to be middle quality organisms or organisms that can uh, tolerate a little bit of pollution, uh, but also can't have too much. Otherwise they will not be found here or they will die here. So. We do not want that. We definitely like those, those middle quality organisms uh, to hang out in our pond. That tells us our pond is relatively healthy, which is good. That's what we expect in most water bodies in Iowa. We like to see those middle quality organisms. And the first one we are gonna talk about is the individual that's in Claire's hand here. And this is actually a juvenile dragonfly. So this is a dragonfly nymph or a dragonfly larvae is what we would call them. And if we look at this critter here, Obviously it is an insect, it has three body segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and it also has those three pairs of legs, or six legs if you would uh, prefer to call it that. So just visually we can tell that is an insect for sure. Compared to its close relative, the damselfly, if we look at the abdomen, so I will put my, my finger here, the abdomen, which is that back section there, it is going to be much wider than the damselflies. Uh, if we look at the tail, it's got this short little teeny tiny stubby tail that does have three little uh, points that come off it. So it does have three little tail sections, but they are much shorter and much firmer and uh, almost sharper looking than the damselfly nymph. So those two are a little different. We're gonna show you damselfly here in just a minute. But if you can see, it might be really tough to focus on in the, in the camera here. Our dragonfly nymph here has actually started to develop its wings or its wing casings. So it is already in the process of going through metamorphosis and these insects can actually live in the water for up to five years depending on the species that we have. And you will notice that we always keep this bug in the water and the primary reason for that is because they do, uh, like fish, have gills right now. So that is part of their aquatic form of their life cycle. Their gills are located in their abdomen and to actually put water over those gills, they will uh, take water in through a siphoning type mechanism and they will shoot the water across the gills and it will actually release at the end of the abdomen. 
uh, so you can actually see them breathe, which is kind of cool, unique feature of this bug. And if they want to swim really fast for a really short period of time, they can actually use that set of gills to propel themselves in a, a very quick manner in, in a short burst. So cool little bug here. This is a relatively large dragonfly nymph. We do have some smaller ones, and I'm going to place one right next to this guy so you can see a little bit of the difference in size. So there are our two nymphs. We have two species there. Obviously the one on the left is a little bit larger and the one on the right is just a little bit smaller and they even get tinier than that. So we do have a multitude of species here. Nonetheless, our dragonflies are going to be predators. They're predaceous when they are actually in their aquatic form, uh, just like when they are in their terrestrial form as well. But they will eat other aquatic macroinvertebrates that are, that are swimming around in the water with them. It could be scuds, it could be uh, various types of aquatic beetles. They eat a large variety of things. Some will even catch fish depending on their size. And we also have some fish in the bucket here. So those can all serve as food sources for our dragonfly nymphs. So here we have our next aquatic macroinvertebrate. This is the damselfly nymph. Again, you will notice it is very similar to our dragonfly nymph. Uh, because they are in the same family, they have very similar features. The body shape is, is almost the same length, almost the same size. These guys are a little bit smaller and you will notice the body is much thinner. But again, they have those three sets of legs. They have the head, thorax, abdomen, just like our, our dragonfly nymph does. And we're gonna kinda square him back here, perfect. Uh, but if we look at this guy from underneath, and we're not gonna be able to show you here because it's so tiny, they actually have external gill filaments, unlike our dragonfly nymph that has the gills located internally in the abdomen. And those gill filaments are located just beneath the head. So they breathe just like a uh, fish would, except they're not covered by gill plates or anything like that, like a fish has. Uh, last thing about this guy, if we look at the tail section, and I think we will dip him in the water here so you can see a little better. He'll splay his tail out, perfect. You see those three fine little feathery tail segments? That absolutely tells me that 100% this is a damselfly nymph. So this is a relatively big one. They do come much smaller. And most often our, in our pond, we do find these in two colors. They can be brown or green, and that is primarily used for camouflage to hide themselves from things like dragonflies or predaceous diving beetles or any of those organisms that might consume these guys. So again, that is our damselfly nymph. This is a scud, which is a species of amphipod. Uh, they are also a crustacean, so one of the, the non-insects we are going to talk about today. Scuds are very unique. Uh, they have lots of legs. They have seven pairs of legs, or 14 legs total. They do spend their entire life in the water. Uh, but just like other crustaceans, they do molt their shell, and they can molt it up to nine times throughout their life. And the reason they molt that shell is so that they can actually grow into it or grow a larger shell. So scuds are also related to freshwater isopods, which are another species that we have here in our pond. But I can definitely tell you that this is a freshwater scud based on the way that it swims. Uh, it is laterally compressed, just like our freshwater isopods are. Uh, but these guys do swim just a little bit differently. They're, they're more on their side rather than uh, swimming vertically like an isopod does. So again, this is a freshwater scud, and this is another middle quality organism. We have a water boatman. They get their name because if you look at the shape of the head, thorax, abdomen in combination, they look a lot like a small boat, like a kayak or canoe maybe. And if you look at their long legs that they use to paddle themselves, they actually look like canoe or kayak paddles. So on the ends of those legs, they have little filaments uh, or small hair-like appendages that actually help them to move themselves quicker in the water or propel themselves faster in the water. Uh, but these guys swim super fast and they do not like to sit still. So that's about all we're going to talk about here. They are related to another species that we have here that's called a back swimmer. But I can tell this is a water boatman because if I look at the face, it looks, uh, it's kind of fused and looks more like an Imperial soldier from the Star Wars series. And the white portion of this particular insect species is not showing like a back swimmer does. So a back swimmer flips on their back and shows their belly. This guy is definitely showing us its top side. So this is 100% a water boatman.
All right, our next species is one that likes to move a lot, uh, and you can tell by its name, this is a water strider. So we're gonna do our best to talk about this one very quickly. But water striders, if you look at those legs, they are super long, and they're actually coated in thousands of hairs. So each of those legs has thousands of hairs on it. And those legs are actually used to uh, take advantage of one of water's greatest qualities, which is surface tension. And those long legs help them to actually utilize surface tension so they can stay on top of the water without sinking themselves. So they distribute their weight so that they are, are not uh, having weight in one area, so they're not sinking and they're they're utilizing those long legs to, to kind of distribute that weight. So very cool critter. You will see these in pretty much any system. Could be a pond, could be a lake, could be river. They even have them in salt water in some places. Again, they are an insect. They have a, a set of antenna, three body segments, and if we can see the front legs, it might be kind of tough. But we're going to get him back here in just a second. But if you look at those front legs when we get him back here, the front legs are actually much shorter than the back legs. And the reason for that is they are aquatic predators and they need to be able to catch their prey adequately. So to do that, they use those short legs to kind of grab and hold onto their various prey items. So again, this is a water strider and a very distinct animal because they are going to be on the water surface most of the time. All right, so we got to see some great aquatic macroinvertebrates here in my bucket. What we are looking at, now that, now that we've kind of seen all the species that we have in our, our wetland pond here, what I can tell you using my Iowa water data sheet uh, that actually a lot of our scientists in Iowa use. Using that data sheet, I can tell you that the majority of those insects, in fact, all of them fall into that middle quality category. So it tells me that I do have some pollutants in the pond behind me. As far as nitrates go, it is definitely high in nitrates. I can tell you that from doing sampling in the past. Uh, but we do actually have good dissolved oxygen. We have very low phosphates. Uh, we do have relatively low ammonia, which is very good. Uh, but those bugs can tell me a lot without me having to sample all the, the chemicals uh, that are in my pond here. So we have all these great bugs, dragonfly nymphs, water striders, water boatmans that now have told me, hey, you have pretty good water, but it could be better. So what we now do as scientists is we look at ways that we can possibly improve this uh, particular watershed. And what I can tell you is, so I have a, a feeder creek that comes in the back of my, my wetland pond here. And it is actually directly fed by a tile line. And what happens is when that, when those agricultural fields drain off directly, because they have nothing to filter out a lot of the nitrates and phosphates and things on the, uh, below the soil and on the soil surface, uh, a lot of those actually get washed off the field with the topsoil and they get dumped into the pond here. And when we have heavy rains, say in the spring or in the fall, that is when I actually see a climb in my, my nitrates and things. So that is part of the reason I have the algae bloom going on behind me here. We have had rain the last couple days, it's gotten warmer. Uh, so those in combination, the high nitrates, the rain and the, the rising temperature, I now have this algae bloom starting to happen behind me. So what I need to do is find a way in that watershed uh, to possibly filter out some of those chemicals or materials that are coming into the system that aren't necessarily helpful, but actually can be detrimental to a lot of my uh, aquatic macroinvertebrates here. So. What I might do, for instance, uh, where that tile line comes in through the creek, I might add a bunch of prairie vegetation. Prairie plants, like big blue stem, have some of the deepest uh, root masses of any plants on earth. Uh, they can be up to about 17 feet deep in the ground, depending on which prairie species you're talking about, not big blue stem in particular. Uh, but I can plant that vegetation in those soil uh, or and those roots will actually adhere to those soil particles and they will uptake a lot of those nutrients that are in the soil uh, and that will improve the the overall nitrate level that i have in here uh, i might, might also use uh, settlement ponds which is something that uh, for instance they've utilized in franklin county at uh, one of their lakes there what i could do is add two settlement ponds or three settlement ponds above this actual wetland so it gives more time and more space for those nitrates to filter out this might be something you could use for your ponds and things too. But those are just a couple of the major changes that I could make to, to take us from that middle quality group up to that high quality group to start to see some of those uh, better insects coming into our system. So thank you for tuning into our video. I hope you've learned a lot. If you do have questions for me, you can definitely contact me by email or you can uh, follow our Facebook page, Calkins Nature Area or Hardin County Conservation. 
You can stay updated with our YouTube videos at Hardin County Conservation uh, on our YouTube page there. And you can also visit HardinCountyConservation.com and that will give you some info on uh, kind of what we're doing, maybe some changes we're making around the county to some of our, our local ecosystems. But nonetheless, thank you for watching and I hope you've learned a lot about our aquatic insects in the state of Iowa.